Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy cool and we're live um thanks for joining me on the podcast and today it's great to be joined by tim Zhu, who's an investment associate at arex bioscience tim how you doing i'm doing well hope you're keeping well as well very good very good Where, whereabouts are you I'm spending some time in Boston right now. Uh, it's not quite okay. the epicenter, but we're riding the wave up still. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, I'm, so, I'm super keen to speak about um, COVID-19, how close we are to cure, vaccines, testing, like all of that good stuff. Um, but maybe just to start with, I mean, what, what's the state of play? Um, certainly where you are. Yeah, I'm in Boston, um, you know, not quite New York status. Uh, I was in New York, so my, uh, I am actually based out of New York normally. Um, okay. And there, long lines for supermarkets. Um, they really cracked down. The streets are empty um, for good reason. Uh, here in Boston, a little bit more relaxed. People are running along the trials, yeah. um, but uh, still quite somber. When did you leave uh, New York? About a month ago. Yeah, before this all okay. got really heated. Yeah. Fine. And so what is Boston's like home for you? I, so I do have uh, friends and family here, so I, I'm spending some time here for the time being. Yeah, yeah. crazy, crazy. Is it going to get, um, I've got a lot of friends talking about that summer's just around the corner and everyone says that the virus might calm down in heat. Is that true? Well, there's a lot of papers out there trying to do that exact analysis, and I think most are concluding no. Um, they're doing these uh, analyses where they... Uh, look at the temperature, look at the humidity, look at where the virus is uh, spread. And, uh, you know, places like Singapore actually haven't had a lot of cases. So that was kind of the right. emphasis to do that type of analysis. But in general, people are concluding, no, um, we can't contain the virus with weather alone. Damn. I'll yeah. get back to all of my WhatsApp groups with, uh, no, that's not true. <laughs> What's, how does it actually work, COVID-19? So it's a virus. It's very much like the cold virus, which is also a coronavirus, um, except this one is quite a lot more dangerous. Um, it has between a 3 and 5% mortality rate, which is uh, much higher than um, what we see uh, with the common cold. Uh, the other thing about it is that it's very, very contagious, as everyone knows now. A lot of people yeah. are asymptomatic. Uh, nowadays, when you go and hear about people doing serology testing, basically checking who has antibodies, We've started doing that um, here, uh, figuring out who has had the virus before. And you go on the street and 30, 40 percent of the people here in Boston, they did a little uh, street canvas, uh, actually have had the virus before in some of these really? studies. Yeah. Crazy. But have they exhibited no symptoms? No symptoms for the most part. For, yeah. Especially Why? Young people. Uh, we don't know yet. I think, uh, you know, young people seem to be fighting off the infection. Sometimes they don't even know. Uh, that they had it, um, but certainly elderly people and those with uh, any kind of comorbidity, so heart disease, diabetes, anything like that, um, they're at a much higher risk. And, and that's what we know so far, but really the, the biology there is not fully understood. Okay. So you're finding then most of the people who make it to ICU, let's say, are older and have, and have got these underlying conditions, so obesity, yeah. diabetes, et cetera. Yeah. And, I, you know, I have a friend who here who practices at Mass General, uh, one of the big hospitals here. Um, and, and she's pointing it out to me as well that uh, definitely there's a, a social economic disparity that we're seeing as well, um, because folks, um, you know, who can't afford to stay at home and with their jobs um, are the ones going out and getting infected. So uh, that's certainly cool. that's a big factor here. I heard that I'm going to get this wrong, but like 170th Street or something uh, in New York is a, is an area of a lot of Latinos and yeah and, and population, and there a lot of them have to travel into the city. And so apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, that that station was so busy, and has been so busy. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I was just driving out there in the Bronx, and and it was pretty scary uh, during all of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I, I drove into. Um, I'm quite near the city of London. I'm about like two miles away, so I like I drove in. I needed to grab something from my office, and and it's interesting. The only people that are around are like you know lower paid workers who are really keeping everything together, like postmen delivering post, security guards, cleaners. You know, the kind of unsung heroes, if you like. You know, where everyone else is hiding at home, you know, avoiding infection. These people are out, and so you know, real credit to them. I think. Mm. Um, right. Why is COVID so frighteningly, frighteningly successful? Why is it so good at spreading? I, you know, if I had the answer to that, I think uh, we have a vaccine uh, right now. Um, that would be a good answer for that. I think uh, you know we don't we don't fully know why it's so successful but you know one of the main things and why it's different from SARS for instance um, or the Mediterranean respiratory syndrome or, or MERS which are both coronaviruses as well is that so many patients are asymptomatic and right. by the time uh, you know you figure out that you have an outbreak already 20 percent of the <laughs> population has already had it um, and spread it so yeah. that's that's really been the problem and how does that, how does it actually work if we go into the science a little bit yeah so what it does so you, as everyone knows it causes pneumonia um and so what it does is the virus um, like a lot of other viruses basically infects the cell it enters the cell it uh, replicates itself so it has rna um most people know about dna but it's uh, it's a single-stranded dna in a sense an rna and once it gets into the uh cell it has its own enzymes that will help to basically replicate that uh, RNA signature and create proteins, create more viruses. Uh, and also it just hijacks the cell. So in these cases, it would be cells in the lungs, cells in the nose. Um, hence, you know, a lot of people actually lose their sense of smell. That's one of the early signs that we're finding out. Uh, so once it replicates it, the, the little virus particles bud, <laughs> from the uh, human cells and they, the human cells basically die. Um, and then there's a major inflammatory response so the, the uh, human immune system reacts to all of this and tries to contain it. And we think that actually has a major uh, sort of uh, bearing on uh, why this disease is so deadly, especially in the elderly population. So a lot of these drugs that we're looking right. at actually are meant to protect the lung or tamp down on the inflammatory right. response. Okay. And you mentioned, you mentioned smell as a symptom. Um, so what are the others? So it's, it's a cough, high temperature and smell. Are, are they the kind of the three main? Yeah. Kind of headache? I think, uh, some of the less specific ones, headache, um, uh, you know, people don't really get runny noses or anything like that. It's very much based in the lung. Uh, dry cough is usually the first symptom, uh, along right. with fever, as you pointed out. Yeah. 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 Fine. Is it true also that um, you can get bigger doses if you're if you've been surrounded by more people with the virus? So like hospital workers, for example, if they're exposed to loads of people, do they get it? Can you get it more aggressively? Or... Yeah, I think that's the thinking. Uh, a lot of the doctors in Wuhan were very, very young. Um, and this is why people were very scared at the beginning. Some of them were in their 20s. And the thinking is that because they were around so many patients with virus, that they, over time, that load uh, did contribute to their illness. I think on a scientific level, that also makes sense. We know that a lot of these viruses can mutate over time. Uh, we know that there's a lot of different strains and there's actually uh, studies now to identify the different strains and you can actually tell a European strain from a US strain. Um, and the really? idea there oh, is that, yes, uh, yes. Wow. I'm hearing that just uh, in the last few days. And the idea there is that if multiple strains get together in a human, uh, actually, there's a possibility that they could exchange, you know, information in a way and become more deadly as a team. So I think that's Amazing. scientifically why that could be happening. Yeah. So how how come so it's a complete um, so if it, if it originated in Wuhan, let's yeah. say, which is the the overriding view, right? Started yeah. in, in Wuhan, and then it left Wuhan. How come it's 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 been what like um, it was the end of last year or beginning of this year? It started to to travel the world it's amazing yeah. how quickly you can tell whether it's a european strain versus 
an American strain, I guess, versus a, an Asian strain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I was I, a friend of mine was telling me they were doing some testing in New York, and the conclusion was actually a lot of the virus came from Europe, not from Asia. All oh, right, interesting. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So someone came. Okay, so it came to Europe first, and then hopped over. Mm-hmm. It's quite interesting because because New York has got a big Asian population, right? Like when I walk around feels like m- more than more than Europe does um yeah very interesting yeah <laughs> crazy um interesting and so, so you mentioned the immune system so so you're saying that really our, our immune system isn't hasn't been effective at combating the virus and in fact it's it's helped to make it a bit more effective or yeah, yeah so um you know people are uh in the ICU and, and the, there's studies coming out now where they're measuring the levels of interleukin-6, which is one of the uh, chemicals that uh, the immune system releases when it's in danger. Uh, and actually they're finding that there's a little correlation between those kinds of immune markers and how sick the patients eventually become. And it turns out there's one of the drugs, um, at tocilizumab, which is being made by Roche, is already used in, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, uh, they're looking to reposition it so that uh, potentially it can work in these patients uh, who have high L- IL-6 levels. So there's a lot of that kind of science going on, trying to figure out that inflammatory response. And in many ways, yeah. uh, in biotech and in medicine, this is a bit of a holy grail, right? If we could fin- uh, really figure out inflammation, we would cure a lot of disease. Uh, but in this yeah. case, the biotech is able to call in some of these drugs and see if they work uh, in these um, in these times. Amazing. Let's dive into that in a sec. Yeah. One, one question I really wanted to ask. So, so if we've, we've kind of understood now that the immune system hasn't been effective at fighting it. Um, but then we see it, uh, in hospital, mostly people who make it to ICU have underlying health conditions, mm-hmm. diabetes, obesity, etc. So I always felt that, uh, you know, like a really good, healthy lifestyle improves your immune system and helps you fight off these things, you know, healthy diet, good exercise, good sleep and so forth. Is that not really so effective at combating this particular virus? Or do you think people who are pretty, you know, who are healthy, eating well, good exercise, not obese, like, you know, fit people are are better at combating it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these health conditions like heart disease or diabetes, you may not think that they really uh, affect the immune system. But in the background, these conditions all weaken the immune system. You know, I yeah. did a lot of um, medical sort of claims research. So working with actual large population data uh, during medical right. school. And we have this index, uh, you know, some may know it as the Charleston Comorbidity Index, where you basically get one point for every one of these conditions. And you do these analyses and you look at which patients have complications after surgery, for instance, and it's really correlated with how many of these conditions people have. Um, so really? all of these things um, are additive on uh, the immune system. Interesting. So you can't help get the virus that that happens. But in terms of effectively beating the virus, healthy, healthy lifestyle, good exercise, nice sleep, like healthy lifestyle will definitely help you. It can set you up, uh, but it's not uh, everything that you need. Um, so you no, still see no. a few young people get the virus, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. Can you get it again once you've had it? I hear different. You know, <laughs> that's one of the big questions, right? And, uh, you, you know, for instance, you may read in the news that in South Korea, they're doing some retesting um, and they're finding that, you know, they're making these claims that, you know, 15 percent of people got the virus again. You never know if it was because they had a false positive on their first test. You know, a lot of this test is actually done with uh, PCR. So they're looking for uh, DNA um, that identifies uh, polymerase chain reactions. So they're actually replicating the DNA and looking for virus uh, DNA, right? Um, So this kind of stuff tends to linger around. You're not finding the virus itself, but you're finding bits and chunks of DNA uh, that are that are still around. So, you know, until we have, um, 
you know, a serological test, which is a test that looks for antibodies against the virus. That's very conclusive for whether you've had the virus before. Until we have that, and you can track over time that these patients are getting the virus, I wouldn't say, again, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, this virus is, you can, we, we can track, which is, which would be very problematic for our health system. Yeah. Fine. So we're not quite sure. It's probably, you probably can't contract it again, but we're not quite sure yet. We're not quite sure. Yeah. We right. hope not. Have... That would be very, for va vaccines, for treatments, that all, that would all be very, very difficult to deal with. Yeah. yeah. Let's cover the tests now, actually. Um, yeah. Quite useful. So I know there's a few, right? Like three or so different ones. Can you run through the different types of tests? Yeah, so there's the so the PCR test I was mentioning. Um, it's probably very, very sensitive, but you know, the test results uh, may remain positive over time. There was someone who tweeted uh, from Boston that they tested positive like 37 days later. Uh, they were still positive by that test. So, so 37 days later after their first after positive, recovered. they were still positive. Yeah. So that right. goes to show, right? That that's not the best test. Um, there's also an ELISA test, which looks for proteins. It's trying to identify proteins that are specific to um, to the virus. Um, that's a little bit better. Um, and then finally, there's a serological test, which is looking for antibodies. So the antibodies that your immune system is making against the virus, and that's probably mm -hmm. the best way to know for certain if someone has been exposed. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. that test, you can't know when that happened, because for the most part, once you start making antibody, you're going to make the antibody for a long time. Uh, at least that's what we hope. Um, so those are kind of the main tests, and they all have their pros and cons. Yeah. Right. So, so with the antibody test, um, so if I've had the virus, I'm, I've recovered, I'll still have the antibodies in my system and would test positive on that test, presumably. Yes. Um, and that's, I think, very critical to reopening the economy. And uh, you can imagine that if a bunch of people have been, who have been sitting at home who may have been exposed, we don't know. So if everyone could get that test, then you could know who's safe to go out, assuming no one can get reinfected and assuming that you know, they're reasonably healthy. Those are the types of people um, who we think can probably go out and restart their jobs because they're probably immune to the virus. Okay. How, how accurate is it? I, I've heard reports that it's not great yet. You can imagine that, um, you know, the antibodies to these viruses, uh, there may be numerous and we need to figure out which ones are best. So there are multiple types of uh, specific antibodies that are targeting the virus, right? We need to figure out which one is most specific to someone definitely having um, overcome the virus. Uh, yeah. And that test will probably improve over time. From what I hear right now, it's not at an accuracy level where we can be too certain. What's a good accuracy level that's like that can be relied upon? I think over 90, 95 percent we're getting there. Um, but obviously, yeah. You know, the older you are, the more risk you're going to be at. Um, so a false negative would be far more harmful in someone over 40, for instance. And you probably want to be yeah. a little more certain than that before having them go out. Yeah. So these so these are available currently, but not reliable enough yet to say, OK, cool. You've had it. You could go back to work or you could wear a T-shirt saying I've had the virus or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think it will still take some time. And and those are also the tests where we want to be able to make millions and millions and make them there of tests and make them quite reproducible. Um, so we're, we're definitely not there yet um, on that type of test in particular. When 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 do you think um, we're going to get there and that, and that more will be readily available? I think this type of test is very feasible. We have this type of test for so many different diseases, um, including viral diseases. So I think it's a matter of time. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the big companies that are making these tests, like Roche, have, okay. you know, are very, very uh, strong, have a very strong history of being able to manufacture large numbers of those types of tests. Um, yeah. So reliably, that's, that's also the other important part. Um, so I think we should be able to get there in a matter of months, uh, short months. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So once that happens, it feels like the economy can start to to open up a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, and I think even without that, you're, you're seeing that in some countries they're starting to talk about 
you know, people under 20 or people under 30, people under 40 who are definitely are at lower risk, even without the test, I think you can start considering um, reopening the economy. But I, I think you have to be really, really careful because, uh, you know, I would say in China, for instance, you know, I grew up there for a few years of my life. There's definitely just the culture of wearing masks, you know, during SARS, you saw that happen, but it never happened in the Western world until now. Um, and I think it's just a cultural thing in a way that, uh, yeah, I also heard, do you right? Uh, I also heard in, 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 a in Asia that people spit more on the street, whereas in Europe, America, we blow our noses, tissues. Does that spread disease a bit more as well? Virus and disease? I think in theory it does. Um, people spit on the street, uh, but people are also wearing masks. So that that's the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I had to... On the masks, um, I read something. I read something. The problem is, like, problem is reading things half the time. You've got no idea what's accurate or not. But does the masks stop you getting the virus or really stop you spreading the virus? So there have been actual science experiments where they measure how far the particles go. And they uh, so, so the, the science is that the biggest particles, as you can imagine, are the most dangerous because they're going to land on someone. They're going to stay. The virus is going to be able to stay hydrated um, in this particle. Uh, for a longer period of time. But the smaller particles are the ones that travel farther. Um, and the masks actually uh, sort of stop less of that, right? Because they're smaller. Uh, so it is a bit of a trade-off, but I think the consensus is that if you can at least stop a lot of the big particles, which the masks, even a homemade mask would, would, would help with, um, it may not yeah. be 100%, but it definitely could help there, uh, <clears throat> that you're gonna stop a lot of the transmission of the disease. Oh, okay. So you suggest like we should get on the masks because in, yes, in, in... CDC finally got on it. CDC said everyone should be wearing some kind of cloth covering when they go out. Here though, in London, it's not the case. It's not it's not been the case that the, if I, unless I've missed it, I mean, the government haven't been saying here, you've got to wear a mask because I know in yeah. other places you've got to wear a mask to go out. Here, it's not been the case and maybe it should be. Um, you know, I think maybe also after this, you'll see You'll certainly see more people keeping their distance long after this is yeah, yeah. It's been very interesting to see how society starts to change after this sure. what do you think what do you think of the um the bluetooth um apps tracking. that they yeah, the tracking apps i know they're using it in singapore i think i spoke to a friend yeah. of mine there. what do you think about that i think it's also a cultural thing i think in in <laughs> asia you know it, not to be political, but in China, people are used to being tracked in that way. Um, and, yeah. you know, I, I just think our culture in the West may not be willing to to uh, to give up that kind of information. But, you know, you see these, um, I don't know if you saw that uh, sort of anonymized uh, tracking system where they looked at, they zoomed in on this beach in Florida and then they <laughs> tracked all the phones across the country. That was scary, right? <laughs> that is scary. That is, yeah. it's crazy. It's a fine line. I mean, if the, if the data is anonymized and this is the kind of line that, you know, people don't trust, I guess. I mean, I mean, certainly it's going to, would be proved to be very useful, certainly to warn people to keep them indoors and those kind of things. I'm, uh, I'd be surprised if we see it in the, in the U S and the UK, we do have an app in the UK. I'm not sure how, how widely it's been downloaded and adopted but we're also quite cautious on the security thing here yeah, yeah, yeah. that is interesting moving on to biotech and big pharma so i'm interested to hear like what their response has been um in terms of of the drugs available to treat covid patients yeah there's been a a really big response um and and i think I, I, as i write about in this blog you really see how much pharma and biotech have learned in the last um, you know, century, and they're bringing it all to fight the virus. Um, so I write about you know, antivirals, the classic drugs like Tamiflu, um, but you know, ideally more tailored to the virus uh, that you know, could prevent the actual replication of the virus. Um, all of those steps I mentioned are being targeted. Uh, you see drugs that um, they're bringing in from uh, you know, other diseases like um, 
uh, pulmonary fibrosis, right? So they're bringing those drugs in be, with the hope that, you know, part of the mechanism of those diseases overlaps with that lung injury that we just spoke about. Okay. Uh, so, and then the, all the anti-inflammatory drugs you see, uh, like the IL-6 drug I mentioned, you know, that's a drug that's gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of different indications, all autoimmune conditions. Uh, what, is the, what is that drug exactly? So it's uh, tocilizumab, IL-6. Uh, so it's used in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we, it's used actually for CAR-T. So I, um, if you're aware of CAR-T, it's used to kind of prevent the uh, CAR-T, which is basically infusing T cells to, to kill cancer. Uh, T cells are immune cells that are, um, you know, bring on the immune response, but it also harms some of the normal tissue and causes, you know, toxicity to the brain and also releases a bunch of chemicals that make the body feel like it's um, sort of in danger. Uh, so this IL-6 drug is actually used to prevent some of the complications associated with CAR-T therapy, for instance. So th th that's just one example of, you know, yeah. being creative, taking uh, something that already is approved or in phase three trials very far along and very quickly we'll be able to see if uh, they help some patients. Uh, so you've got, so it sounds like you've got different categories. You've got like drugs that are already being used for other, to treat other illnesses, diseases, and so forth. that yep. are kind of what, being re remodeled, retested. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, and the third category I uh, didn't mention uh, earlier is, you know, there are actual targets on this virus that people are going after with novel antivirals. So um, for instance, um, you know, blood pressure medications like called ACE inhibitors. So lisinopril is one of those. Um, actually, people found out that the virus uses ACE2, this, this, um, this molecule on the surface of human cells to get into the cell. So that was a bit of a serendipitous finding a few years ago with um, SARS. And now right. we're finding that this virus also uses ACE2. So you have a company called uh, Veer, uh, basically developing uh, an siRNA. So it's a small interfering RNA that actually will knock down the human levels of, um, of ACE2 in hopes that it will basically close all the channels that the virus uses to enter the cell. So that's one example of you know, new ingenuity uh, coming in to, to try to uh, combat the virus. And this is, and this, and these drugs are to combat the virus if you've got it, um, to try and essentially cure you and help your body fight it off. Yes, yes, yes. The idea is that once you close as many of those doors as possible, uh, that gives you your immune system a, a chance to combat the virus, right? Because this is really multiplicative because once the yeah. virus kills one cell, it releases millions of virus particles, and then it goes. Those millions of virus particles goes on go on to the next uh, cells. So, really, anything you can do to pause that or slow that down, in theory, can can cure a patient. Right, and so a treatment maybe might look like a combination of some of these drugs that are on are on trial. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then on the testing side, are they actually of, of these new drugs? Are they are there big sample sizes yet? I mean, presumably it's been quite, it's not been too long. Are, are they just small sample sizes? How, how kind of, how quickly will they start to get to market? Yeah, it's been a major challenge. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's been reading in the newspapers about remdesivir, which is Gilead's drug, and then hydroxychloroquine, and all the tiny little trials that they're running in China and other parts of the world, uh, like the hydroxychloroquine trials from France, very famous. Everyone talked about it. You know, yeah. President Trump has you know, made some statements in the news about that. The issue is all of those trials are not good quality. And in the medical uh, community, we care a lot about the quality of these trials. So some of these trials are uh, basically you follow a cohort of patients, but you don't give another group placebo or uh, sort of just blank pills, right? So you have no idea um, if those patients just weren't all that sick and that's why they all got better. Um, you also have no idea if it was just that hospital. Sometimes uh, these studies bring in control groups from another hospital and they try to do the matching and, and they try to make these mm -hmm. patients about as sick as, as one another. But it's always tricky to interpret those types of studies. Um, so what I would say is, uh, you know, remdesivir, for instance, hydroxychloroquine, uh, Novartis and Gilead um, have both 
launch large randomized trials. And that's what we really need to know. In, in a couple of months, we're going to know with some pretty good certainty whether these drugs work or not. Um, and the okay. FDA, the um, uh, WHO, they also have initiatives to basically run three, 400 patient trials randomized um, to organize all the hospitals to run this so that we get the best data readout possible. And we know for certain uh, whether these drugs work or not. Nice. So what's a, what's a, what's a, a solid number of participants? I would say um, three, 400 patient study. Uh, so at least okay. 200 in each group. So control and, yeah. and uh, drug. Uh, typically, for most of the studies that we see in biotech, um, gives you a good chance of finding a good effect. But we obviously don't know how strong the drug is going to actually work. Um, but in these times, you kind of just have to run with it. Usually in pharma, they yeah. spend a lot of time thinking about, well, we think it's going to have a 20% effect. And we think that we want to power this study so that it's going to have a 95% chance of showing that. And we want to make sure we don't disappoint our shareholders. But, uh, you know, in this time and age, you just have to run with it and hope for the best. Yeah. yeah. So usually it takes years to get these things to market, right? Yeah. It must be, uh, it must be strange, strange for the scientific community. You're like, right, I need it to market in like two months, like crack on and let's get it done. It, it, must, be, uh, it must be weird for these guys and girls to, to kind of adapt a little bit to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I think a lot of ways it's not unlike oncology or, you know, a lot of these cancer drugs that we're testing, they're very competitive, right? You see five, six companies working on the same exact target. You know, as a venture capitalist, we have a lot of difficulty picking out which one to support because they're all the same. And in this way, it's yeah. also, this is the holy grail. This is what everyone's thinking about right now. And everyone's trying to be the first to show data. And, and this is, it's a really noble thing because we need as much as we can get um, at this point. Yeah. Awesome. So it's like, it sounds like it's supercharged everyone to like really get on it, right? For society for profit too if they happen yeah. to be the ones i mean yeah. it's it's a good if i could have a nickel for every company who's come to our vc firm saying oh well we had this neurodegenerative drug uh so for alzheimer's and now we think it actually has an effect in COVID 19 yeah <laughs> I, I would be a very wealthy man if i had a nickel for every company who's done that in the past two months i um, mean that's a great thing that's a great thing some of them are more plausible than others and of course, uh, you know, the later stage it is. So if they're already in phase two, phase three, we're much more comfortable uh, with how safe those drugs are. And we understand the biology much more from previous trials. So you can be a lot more confident in making some of those claims, but we see quite outlandish things. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, what's looking the most promising? So in a couple of months time, what, what do you think we're gonna see kind of being used quite widely? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, hydroxychloroquine, it has its safety issues, um, but, you know, there, there's enough of um, as enough small randomized trials, I think, to really investigate that. Um, I think if it were to work well um, in a large trial, um, I could see it being rolled out. It has its safety concerns. You know, it causes arrhythmias, heart issues, for instance. Uh, so something right. to be very careful there. Uh, remdesivir. You know, there have been some major trials in China that Gilead has put on uh, that they canceled. They stopped midway because they, quote unquote, couldn't uh, enroll enough patients. And that really makes people wonder, you know, <laughs> yeah. did the just not believe that it was going to work? I, you know, it's it makes you wonder if um, it's it's a lot of hype. Um, but, you know, in the next two or three months, we will also know the NIH is putting on a three, four hundred patient trial uh, to, to do that. Um, let me look through my list. I think those are the most promising antiviral drugs. I think a yeah. lot, um, we haven't talked a lot about convalescent serum, which is basically taking antibodies from uh, a patient who has uh, fully yeah. recovered from COVID-19. Uh, actually, that has a strong history in SARS, um, where they actually were able to do that in China, and there were a few studies there. Uh, I think there are a lot of potential there. The, the, the biggest potential there is that in the future, once we identify what those antibodies are, we won't need to extract it from patients who recover. We'll be able to just engineer it in the lab once we know exactly okay. which ones those are. Um, yeah. that, that's the big that potential could, there. That'd be cool. So you think that could be quite effective? Because I had some, one of my colleagues uh, has just recovered and she was going to 
donate some of her blood for research and stuff. Um, which yeah, is very I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and we have some companies out there like Takeda who do a lot of work um, with that plasma. So for instance, they uh, have a treatment for hemophilia. They're one of the leaders there. Uh, and, you know, once we figure out, you know, that this works, that's still a question that this works and um, we know exactly which antibodies there are ways to move very quickly on that yeah yeah what about vaccines the other big uh, the other big topic how close are we to a vaccine that's i think the biggest open question um you know we've as you know we have tried and failed to drug the common cold or to, to develop a very good vaccine for the common cold and that is also a coronavirus um, and so we've tried a, a multitude of different options. So there's like the classic live attenuated virus where they take live virus and they uh, basically remove its ability to kill human cells and then put it back. So that's something that will generate a very strong immune response. But unfortunately, a lot of viruses in particular, we've had trouble developing those types of viruses, uh, vaccines, because you can't work with the live virus very easily. Um, and you also worry about mm -hmm. causing um, COVID-19, right, with that kind of vaccine. So the first vaccine that went into the clinic was from Moderna. Um, so they have an mRNA vaccine, which means they just took the sequence of the virus, they cut out a snippet that they think will generate an immune response, and then they just manufacture that in the lab and turn it into a vaccine. We don't yet know. So that's a very quick way of developing a vaccine. This is usually something that takes right. 10 years, but they got into the clinic within two months, right? Um, and that's, wow. that's very impressive. Um, but what we worry about there is that just a little snippet of mRNA isn't going to generate a long immune response. Um, so there's a couple other approaches. There's actually an approach in China. At long story short, there's even approaches that we haven't uh, fully succeeded in developing a vaccine with in the past. In China, they're working on basically taking human immune cells, programming them to respond to uh, coronavirus and then putting them into the human uh, as a kind of like live uh, vaccine in a way. So long story short, lots of different approaches. We don't even know, for instance, if uh, antibodies alone will uh, be sufficient to give um, provide a response. So if you induce uh, the human immune system to produce antibodies, if that's enough alone, we'll kind of have a hint when we do look at the convalescent serum studies and whether those work or not. Yeah. But there are, the the response that the human uh, immune system needs to make could be much broader than that and that's what makes these vaccines so difficult to develop because you run into these unpredictable uh sort of uh hit roadblocks because actually the immune system yeah. response is a little bit broader than what we think so that's a very long winded answer well, <laughs> yeah. that's great so these vaccines it sounds like they might take the longest to develop of the things we've talked about so actually, a lot of them are in the clinic, and we'll have a sense even this fall um, with phase one, yeah. phase two trials uh, of whether uh, these work, at least in the short run. The challenge there is that we want a vaccine, ideally, that uh, you know at least helps 80% of patients. That's been the bar in the past. And we want to make sure that these vaccines keep patients immune for six months, 12 months. So that's why these trials take a very long time. And the FDA has, in the past, had a very high bar. For what they want to see. I think in this day and age, we have to make do with what we have. Um, as soon as something yeah. begins to work, um, we're going to try to commercialize it. So actually, I think that we might see vaccines, um, you know, early next year really start to take shape. And maybe it's before some of these very targeted antivirals, like those ACE2 ones I mentioned, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, can take off as well. So it's all in the mix. <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. Where's where's the money going? Is it on is it on testing? Is it on vaccines? Is it on um, on on other drugs? Where are you seeing more people invest their money and time? Um, I think drugs still um, are gonna take the lion's share. Uh, the truth is, in the past, uh, our entire biotech field has neglected vaccines uh, because it's a ten year path. You know, uh, sometimes you can't really make money off of them very easily. I, th I do think that we're going to see more prioritization towards vaccines in the future. Um, you see some yeah. of these companies, uh, you know, getting $200 million collaborations. Uh, for instance, uh, Fosun has a collaboration in China 
um, where they put in $200 million um, on a relatively new technology and mRNA uh, approach, right? So um, I think this is in a way actually encouraging the field as a whole along that this, this has happened, um, that we're going to actually reprioritize some of our efforts towards some of these new technologies. Amazing. So just to sum up, in the post-COVID era, once this is blown over, do you see this having a, an effect on the on the biotech and pharma industry in the way that they work, maybe the speed, um, the way they're able to bring these drugs to market? Yeah, I think um, what we're going to see in the short run is that the FDA is going to have a somewhat lower bar because we need to for COVID-19. Um, maybe we'll learn that you know, our bar has been too high in the past. Some people have criticized for the FDA for saying, well, you guys insisted that this drug have 30% effect, but we have 20% effect, why didn't you approve it? So I think um, maybe some of that cultural will, will carry over. There's certainly going to be a major slowdown in drug delivery right now. Uh, so I think there's going to be a bit of a pent up need to kind of move quickly right after. Um, I can definitely yeah. see that happening. A lot of VCs uh, I know are in this time of uncertainty are slowing down in their investments, um, thinking that maybe in a few months, the world will have completely changed. And some of these companies uh, who don't have a, a lot of cash right now will actually be quite desperate in a few months. So I think yeah. there's some uh, kicking the can down the road. But overall, I think it's, it's going to dramatically change, I think, um, how we how we think about prioritizing, especially towards um, sort of anti-infectives, which have been so neglected uh, for so long. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. Oh, uh, great to hear. Great to hear what's going on. And hopefully next time we speak, it will be face to face again. Maybe some <laughs> dinner <like> last time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, who knows when we'll, when we'll be able to travel again. But, um, you know, hopefully it'll be in the next couple of months. Uh, I hope see. so too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much. Have a good one. Thank you. Keep well.